the title of my talk is How the Factorization Method Provides a Quantum Classical Correspondence that Eases the Transition for Students. I know in quantum mechanics we think about teaching quantum in a spins first approach or in a wave function first approach. And neither method has any connection whatsoever with classical mechanics. Sometimes people will teach a historical perspective to try to get the students to have some contact with what was it about classical mechanics that they had trouble with that needed quantum mechanics. But usually those experiments are not very well understood by students who have taken classical mechanics classes because it's not easy to evaluate what black body radiation is in a classical theory and often isn't done in the explanations. So I'm going to show you a different way that you can proceed. So as I had said, classical mechanics and quantum mechanics often seem completely unrelated with a vague and incorrect notion that they agree for large quantum numbers. I'm going to show you two examples of a new connection between classical and quantum that helps students gain intuition about how the two are connected. The idea from this is actually very old. It comes from Born and Jordan's Elementara Quantum Mechanic, which is a book that was written in German in 1930, never translated. But if you notice here when they're talking about the harmonic oscillator, they have this equation B dot is some number times B and B dot dagger is some other number times B dagger. These two numbers are complex conjugates of each other. We're going to get back to that. So I'm going to start with the harmonic oscillator. And the way that you can describe this, and this can be done with freshmen. You know, the freshman physics is all, all that you need in order to understand this. These are Hamilton's equations of motion, but anyone who's taken a first your physics class knows that x dot is p over m and p dot is minus m omega squared x for a harmonic oscillator. The idea is that you decouple the equations. This is a mathematical technique that's well known for how to solve differential equations. You do it by taking a linear combination. We're going to call it a is p plus alpha x. And then we're going to take the derivative and now we're going to take p dot, substitute in what p dot was, x dot, substitute in what x dot was. And now because we want it to be proportional to A so that it's decoupled, I have to factor out the coefficient alpha over M. And you see for this to equal A, this coefficient has to be equal to alpha. So we set them equal and you find that alpha is a pure imaginary number, plus or minus I M omega. Now when I plug into that differential equation, I get this very simple result. A dot is equal to minus I omega A. Yes, it's a differential equation, but all you have to tell the students is this is a function whose derivative is proportional to the function. They all know it's an exponential. So you can immediately solve that. You have two of them, one for a and one for a star. They're solved by the same constant, a0, e to the minus i omega t, where the a0 is just p0, the initial momentum, minus i m omega x0, coming just from the way that we define the, the a0, I mean the a. Okay, and this is not, whoops, that went too fast. Let me go back. Okay, now you can solve for x. We don't take the real part, like you often teach. You solve for x. The imaginary part of a divided by m omega is equal to x, and when you do that, you get exactly the result that you normally get in classical mechanics. Okay, you can get energy conservation as well. If you multiply a times a, a star, what you find is, if you look at it from the definition of A, it's P squared over 2M plus 1 half M omega squared X squared. If you look at it from the solution, it's mod A0 squared because E to the I omega T and E to the minus I omega T have a product that's equal to 1. So energy conservation comes in one line. Now, how do I go to quantum mechanics? To get to quantum mechanics, you make everything into operators and you recall that the commutator of x with p is ih bar. This requires some work to get to this point, but under the assumption that you have done this, now what you see is if you take this operator and you look at a dagger a divided by 2m, which was the energy previously, you can calculate it and you'll get this extra term from the commutator, which when you evaluate it, you can now bring it to the other side and you find the Hamiltonian is 1 over 2m a dagger a plus 1 half h bar omega. It's the quantum Hamiltonian. And here we have this beautiful relationship. This operator a is the quantum analog of the function a that I used to solve for the equation of motion for the classical system. 
So working with this A object makes a seamless connection between classical and quantum mechanics. There are, of course, other things you have to develop. Why am I working with operators? What am I going to do with it once I have it? And so forth. But you can make this nice connection between the two. Now, this isn't just something that works for the harmonic oscillator. It also works for Kepler orbits with hydrogen. And I'm going to try to go through that for you as well. So for uh, for the Kepler problem, you have more complicated equations of motion, but the angular ones are simple because P theta dot is zero, which means that theta dot, um, it means the angular momentum, mR squared theta dot is a constant, and you can then use that to simplify the equations so that you just work with the radial equations. We now have a different combination that we have to take. It's the radial momentum plus alpha over R plus a constant beta. We do the same thing we did before, calculate the time derivative, substitute in those equations of motion, factor out the coefficient of PR, and now I have to make this equal to the A, and that's very simple. This number L squared minus L squared over alpha is alpha, and MK over alpha is beta. So we can again solve for that, and what we find is that Alpha is, again, pure imaginary, plus or minus IL. Beta is also pure imaginary. A dot is minus plus I theta dot A. And that's an exact differential equation that can be solved. You again find A is now A zero e to the I theta. You can think of that as theta of T, or you can think of it the angle in the orbit. And now what's really beautiful is we're going to set the constant A0 by the distance of closest approach where the radial momentum is zero. And now what we can do is we solve for one over R. We again look at the imaginary part A minus A star, and it gives us a constant times a cosine. And just by moving that constant on the left-hand side, this one over here, to the right-hand side, you get the equation of the orbit. And you can put it into standard form using energy conservation. This is by far the easiest derivation of the equation of the orbit that I know of. No integrating to inverse tangents and you don't have to get the energy first and so forth. You get the energy the same way that we did before by just looking at A star A divided by 2M. In this case, it'll give you the energy plus an extra constant, but the whole thing is a constant, so you can subtract the constant from it and you will get the, uh, uh, the result for conservation of energy. So now, how does this go to hydrogen? Well, again, with hydrogen, you have your canonical commutation relation between the radial coordinate and the radial momentum. It's equal to I h bar. You just form 1 over 2 m a dagger a. You have to calculate this commutator. It's not that difficult to do. And when you get that, you will get a term that looks like L times L minus H over 2 m r squared. You should recognize this as the Hamiltonian for hydrogen with an extra constant in it. You move the constant to the other side. And what you find, if you set the angular momentum to H bar L plus 1, you get exactly the Hamiltonian for the Coulomb problem in a fixed angular momentum space. And so you can then show how that gets solved. So this is the standard result as we all, always see in quantum mechanics. Okay, so this simplified treatment of the classical orbit also provides a neat connection to the quantum solution. And this also will work with some other problems as well. So I don't know about you, but I think this is pretty cool and I think it's a really neat way of trying to connect classical with quantum that actually could make sense to the students. Yes, they have to know how to work with complex numbers, but it's worth taking that time to teach them that so that they can enjoy looking at things from this perspective. So thank you, Born and Jordan. Uh, this simple insight leads to a much deeper relationships that I think provide a new way of thinking about even the correspondence between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. And for sure, it provides a really neat way to relate these classical dynamical solutions of position and momentum as a function of time to the quantum solutions via this technique, which is called the factorization method. But interestingly, when you proceed this way, you don't actually have to factorize anything because the process of constructing what you're constructing is already in the factorized form. Okay, so this is work that I did with Leanne Dowdy and Jason Tron. This is work that was supported by the Air Force. Both of these papers are gonna be forthcoming in American Journal of Physics, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them.
So, I, I, th I mean, there is this book of Born and Jordan, I think also Planck uh, uh, talk about the simple harmonic oscillator in some of his papers. Why do you think that historically then in textbooks it became uh, the, the way of teaching it uh, different? Well, Born and Jordan wanted to emphasize matrix mechanics, and at that time everyone wanted to learn about uh, wave mechanics. Mm -hmm. Now, they do not cover the Kepler problem in their book. They didn't know how to solve it in this way. That had to wait until Schrodinger solved it in 1940 using the factorization method, and no one went back. In fact, I was shocked when I was looking at the book and I saw these, those equations that I showed you right at the beginning. I was like, wait a second, this is actually something pretty cool. And then we were shocked to learn that it works for these other problems as well. And it's actually a general result. You can prove that for any classical problem, you can find a way of solving it in this fashion and then relating it to a quantum problem. But when you relate it to the quantum problem, just like what happened with hydrogen, the classical Hamiltonian and the quantum Hamiltonian are often a little bit different. There's a quantum correction in the quantum case that disappears in the classical case coming from that commutator. So it was just a matter of that people were, uh, it was fashionable to do wave mechanics. Yeah, I can't say whether Born and Jordan could have figured this out on their own. All I know is that they didn't, <laughs> okay? And no one else has until, you know, like a year ago when we, when we sort of worked this out, yeah. All right, very nice.